and to introduce our guest speaker. Um, we are grateful to be gathered in the spacious and beautiful Lead Gallery, which is the space that doubles the size of our downstairs auditorium. And so for very special speakers, we sometimes have to move it up here to order accommodate the audience that wants to see the presentation. Tonight our speaker is Alison Smith, the lead, lead curator of 19th century British art at London's Tate Britain. Her presence in that art world is, our, is monumental. Before joining the Tate in 2000, Alison lectured uh, in the history of art at Birmingham University and Sotheby's Institute, London. She is the author of Victorian Nude, Sen Sexuality, Morality, and Art that was published in 1996, and a number of other publications on aspects of 19th century British art and culture. At Tate Britain, she's responsible for acquisitions, collections research, exhibitions, and displays relating to Victor the Victorian era. Recent exhibitions included one on John Everett Millay, 2007, Watercolor, 2011, and most recently, Pre-Raphaelite's Victorian Avant-Garde, which has toured the world, uh, and ha which has circumnavigated the glo globe and recently come back to Britain, 2012. We currently, we're currently, sh she is currently working on an exhibition on artist and uh, called Artist and Empire, for to be uh, to come out in 2015, November 2015, which she discussed at length on a soon-to-be-aired program on BYU, uh, our BYU radio program, Thinking Aloud. Watch for that. Before we ever met Dr. Smith, we knew of her erudition, of her scholarship, and of her impressive and influential record. The bonus in working with her directly here this week has been the revelation of her that her human empathy is equal to her scholarly excellence, and that her generosity of spirit is consistent with the scale of her professional achievements. I know that as she speaks tonight, you will also discover her to be the whole package, the real deal, a thoughtful soul who cannot refrain from both sharing knowledge and enlightenment when she speaks authoritatively on virtually every topic. Expect a lot, and you will not be disappointed. We don't say this before every talk. <laughs> Welcome, Allison Smith. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. I can't wait to hear myself speak. <laughs> now, um, let's move on from that image. Can you all hear me? Excellent. Now, um, I've arrived in Utah. I came over on Tuesday, and it feels so different from London. I feel I've acclimatized already. So I have to remind myself what London looks like. So I'm showing you to begin with a picture of the place where I work. This is Tate Britain in London. Now, I can't assume that you're, you've all been to London or that you've all been to Tate Britain, but I hope after hearing me today, you will rush over to London and go to the Tate. But um, just to give you a bit of historical background, the Tate Gallery opened in 1897. That was the year of Queen Victoria's Diamond Jubilee, and it opened as the National Gallery of British Art. So it showed British art from artists born after 1790. So when we talk about the 1890s, so it was under 100 years of British art. So it just focused exclusively on British art. Now what's interesting about the Tate as an organization is how it's always transforming and developing itself. Because a few years later, in 1917, its role changed again. It became the National Gallery of Historic British. So it's British art going back to the 16th and 17th century, to the present day, and also of modern foreign art. So you now have to imagine the Victorian pictures which open the gallery are being squeezed for space. And then this continued through the course of the 20th century. We acquired more and more modern foreign works alongside the British until you get to 2000, and that's when Tate Modern opened downriver at um, the, um, the big power um, station which was converted. And then we became Tate Britain, showing Brit showcasing British art from 1550 up to the present day. And this was the moment when the Victorian collection became really squeezed, because more contemporary and modern art to show. And so um, now, 
2014, the Victorian pictures occupy two or three galleries. But having said that, they are still the main attraction. So you see here, this is one of our guides showing a visitor who's obviously enthralled by the Ophelia experience. People come from far, all over the world, just to gaze at Ophelia. It's the, number, the most popular painting in the whole um, collection. So even though the Victorian pictures, the Pre-Raphaelite pictures, occupy only a few galleries, they are the major attraction, and we are well aware of that. Now, Mark invited me here today to talk to you about my role as a curator. Now, curating takes place on many different fronts. We work on acquisitions, on the collection, on displays, and also on exhibitions. In this talk, I'm going to be focusing mainly on exhibitions, but I want to say a little bit about displays. This is a photograph taken just last month in August when our pre-Raphaelite paintings came back from a world tour and were put back on display in Gallery 9. And you see here two art handlers posing with Ophelia. This is for a press um, photograph. Now these paintings, all our pictures, are now hung chronologically. We start in 1550, and you go year by year up to the present day. So it's hung in strict chronological sequence, which allows for some surprising juxtapositions and points of comparison. All the paintings in Gallery 9 are hung virtually floor to ceiling. And before the pre paint, when the pre-Raphaelite paintings were away, we had a Victorian gallery with no pre-Raphaelite pictures. So when they all came back, you know, 20, 30, 40 plus works, we had to accommodate them. So we completely rehung the gallery. And even, even as we were hanging, people were sort of queuing up outside to come in and pay homage to the paintings. So it's wonderful to have them back again. But just to make the point that with the permanent gallery, the permanent hang, or what we call the semi-permanent hang, you can come in any day for free and just sit down and look at the paintings. So the idea of a permanent display is for sort of continuous looking over a prolonged period of time. Exhibitions, on the other hand, are far more unpredictable because exhibitions are events which require a lot of people to organize an event which um, takes place it's a transient event. It takes place in time and, spa in time and space. And it requires a huge amount of effort to put paintings up. And they're only up for a couple of months, and then they come down again. And I think it's the excitement these exhibitions sort of generate, which also provokes um, controversy. And this is certainly true of the whole history of the Pre-Raphaelites. So these exhibitions are more akin to theatrical or musical productions, really, that there's this excitement, and you, you come along to see something as a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. Now, having said this, we have to remind ourselves that the whole idea of an exhibition, a lone exhibition, is a fairly recent phenomenon when we compare it to the long history of theatre or concert production, for example. The first loan exhibition took place exactly 200 years ago. This is when the British Institution in London held an exhibition in honour of Joshua Reynolds. This was in um, 1813. And this idea of organising an exhibition, a retrospective exhibition to celebrate an artist, really caught on in the course of the 19th century. And the Pre-Raphaelites, their reputation was consolidated through these lone exhibitions. Um, yes, here we, here we are. So the first of these took place in 1883. This was to commemorate Rossetti, who died the previous year. And these were followed by exhibitions devoted to the still living Millet and Hunt in 1886, 1898, and 1906. Um, so these were big events. Um, the Millet exhibition um, in 1886 attracted over 80,000 visitors, which might not seem much by today's standards, but bearing in mind that London was a you know, smaller city at that time, that's a vast amount. People were pouring in to sort of celebrate the works by these great sort of national artists. And I show you here, show you here a photograph of Millet at the time of the 1886 exhibition in his studio at Palace Gate. He had amassed an incredible fortune by this time. He was reckoned to be one of the 40th, 40th wealthiest men in Britain. And he's shown here very happy in his chair reading the um, um, Times. This photograph was taken by Beatrix Potter's father, Rupert Potter, who was a photographer. I mention that because you can see there's a reference to Beatrix Potter in the wonderful costume exhibition here. 
Anyway, I, I digress. Anyway, these exhibitions really paved the way for the first survey exhibitions of the movement. And these happened not in London, this is important to note, but outside of London, in the regions. In fact, the first place ever to, to mount the first survey exhibition devoted to the Pre-Raphaelites was Birmingham Museum and Art Gallery, which you see here in this 19th century drawing. And I show you this particular slide because it's interesting because it shows the art gallery on the left with its tower next to the council hall. And this is to make the point that the promotion of the Pre-Raphaelites was very much tied up with the civic identity of these regional museums. A lot of the important collectors of the Pre-Raphaelites were industrialists, wealthy industrialists and merchants from the Midlands and the North, and they were very proud of you know, um, this inheritance, and they wanted to give it to the city as a kind of civic gift, as civic gospel, really based around the Pre-Raphaelites and making these paintings available to a wide um, audience. So the Pre-Raphaelites were key to the identity of Birmingham, and all the people involved, most of the key people involved with the establishment of the museum, donated works. So for example, the MP for Birmingham at the time, William Kenrick, Liberal MP, he was also sort of chairman of their collecting committee and also trustee and chairman of the art school around the corner, which taught art according to Pre-Raphaelite and arts and crafts principles. He donated this painting on The Blind Girl by Amile shortly after the gallery um, opened. And this is one of the paintings. You have to go to Birmingham. People will say, you have to go and see The Blind Girl. It's one of those famous um, paintings. So just to show you how the Pre-Raphaelites were very much tied up with the identity of these museums. And this also leads me to make the point that the regions in Britain were always at the forefront and still are in promoting um, the Pre-Raphaelites. Not just Birmingham, Manchester. Manchester had an important collection of works by Maddox Brown and other Pre-Raphaelites. And Liverpool, again, there's a huge Pre-Raphaelite following in Liverpool. Important collectors like George um, Ray, Frederick Leyland, Lever Hume, you know, Open Court Sunlight, these are big collectors of Pre-Raphaelite works and these were acquired or denoted to the um, Walker Art Gallery in Liverpool. Just to show you a couple of key paintings here, these were acquired by Philip Rathbone, who was the chairman of the um, Art Gallery at this time. Um, and the painting on the bottom um, right is Rossetti's Dante's Dream, which was acquired in 1881. And this was such a key event, there was a huge party held in the city, a huge civic reception to receive this work into the gallery. Above it, there's Millet's um, Lorenzo and, and Isabella, another key work which was donated, or acquired rather, in 1884. So you know, the key pre like collections in the 19th century were not in London, they were in Manchester, they were in Birmingham and Liverpool. So how do people feel in London about this? Well, the answer is rather jealous. In 1911, um, when Charles Aitken became um, keeper, um, he held it in an exhibition of the Pre-Raphaelites in London from Birmingham, and he noted with envy that Birmingham had incredible holdings, and he sort of looked at this painting by Holman Hunt, The Finding of the Saviour in the Temple, which had been given to the city by another important um, um, donor, and he said, if only we had works like this in London. So this brings us back, of course, to the Tate and how the Tate was established. Well, the Tate, as I told you earlier on, was set up in 1897 as an adjunct, really, to the National Gallery down the, the road. It was seen to be a bit of a dumping ground for unwanted pictures. Um, just to give you a bit of background, Henry Tate had a collection of contemporary British art, which he wanted to donate to the, the, the nation. He offered it to the National Gallery. They turned it down. So he went back to the Treasury and said, will you accept it if I give you the money to build a gallery? And then they thought again. Um, but, um, but then there's more on provocation, and eventually they found a site which was the disused um, Millbank Penitentiary, where all the convicts were sent out to Australia. And the idea was, let's turn this prison into an art gallery for the poor people of London. Again, it was set up on the same civic principles, art of a mission for the people. So the core collection was Henry Tate's gift to the nation, which included Ophelia, which you see there, and then there were transfers from the National Gallery, which included only a very few Pre-Raphaelite works, one of them being William Dice's incredible painting, incredible landscape, Pegwell Bay. And the other pictures were just um, donations and gifts. 
and William Morris's La Belle Result was a gift to the gallery from Jane Morris, who was um, his, his, his wife. So most of these works have been acquired as gifts and donations. They hadn't been purchased in a strategic way. And by 1900, the Tate could boast of 12 Raphaelite pictures, which was quite a small number when you compare to you know, the, the, the vast collections in the Midlands and the North. So the early keepers of the gallery wanted to correct this deficiency. And um, a few years later, D.S. McColl, who was the keeper, he came up on a mission and he had set up a desiderata list of all the works he wanted to acquire. And under his keepership, um, Tate acquired Arthur Hughes's uh, uh, April Love, which is one of the favorite pictures amongst you know, the public visitors to the Tate um, today. And this um, I mission to acquire pre-Raphaelite works was maintained by his successor, um, Charles um, Aitken, when he took over as director in 1911. And this was the year when we had this loan exhibition. Um, I show you the catalog here. Uh, works by the pre pictures lent by the Art Gallery Committee of the Birmingham Corporation. Now, why did Birmingham lend these pictures? Well, their gallery was closed for refurbishment, and they had nowhere to store the paintings, so they offered them to London. And London you know, was very keen to have these pictures, so they could show them next to the, the small Raphaelite collection in the Tate, and it would complement it. And they felt this would help enhance the profile of the Raphaelites in London, and maybe encourage people to donate. Now, where was this exhibition held? It was 93 works, and these 93 works were squashed into one room, a room right at the, if I can use this, no, it's right at the um, top right-hand side, not the little square room, the room next to that. The little square room housed the Tate Raphaelite pictures, and the room next to it housed these 93 works um, from Birmingham. And the catalogue was a very small, modest publication, which just listed the works in no particular order. So the point I'm making here is that exhibition making was much easier in the past. It was simply a case of one keeper writing to another keeper and then putting the works, wrapping them up, putting on the train, bringing them on a cart and installing them. No insurance, no condition checking, no sort of packing, no you know, press campaign, anything like that. It was a very simple, low-key matter. Another interesting feature about these early exhibitions was that they included far more works on paper than they did paintings. And this is because um, drawings at this time had a particular reputation. There was a lot, the, aesthetic, the drawing had an aesthetic appeal, and there were lots of collectors who specialized in um, drawings. Also, they were on the market. They were cheap, and they were available. And as some of the 19th century collectors were dying, dying off, they denoted their works to museums. And so some museums inherited these huge bequests. In 1927, for example, a solicitor from Birmingham called James Richardson Holiday donated over 1,000 works to Birmingham, and then another couple of hundred to Cambridge and to the Tate. And so this enabled these museums to develop these wonderful holdings of pre-Raphaelite works. But also, I think another reason why the exhibitions include a lot of works on paper was that they caused less disruption to um, galleries. They're much easier to take down off the walls than paintings are. So we have to imagine this early exhibition full of works on, um, on paper and, um, and a few paintings you know, um, sprinkled in between. Now this exhibition, the 1911 exhibition, paved the way for another exhibition at the Tate in 1923, which was on works on paper. And this was black and white illustrations from the 1960s period. And all these works came from one collection, from a collector called um, Harold Hartley, who specialized in book illustrations. And um, this was an exhibition of 364 works squeezed into two galleries. So again, pi you know, piled high from um, plinth up to um, ceiling. And um, I think the Tate might have hoped that these works would be donated. They weren't, actually. I think um, Hartley was hoping they would be purchased. In the end, they went to the Museum of Fine Art in Boston, not to um, um, Britain. But it was a key event. These are two of the works included in that 1923 exhibition, on Millet's Prodigal Son from the Parables of Our Lord, and Rosetta's engraving the Maids of Elf in there. Tiny works. Here, they're large to a, a grand um, scale. 
This exhibition paved the way that very same year, 1923, for another exhibition called um, um, Artists of the, 19, of the 1860s period. And this was probably one of the most important shows I think ever been held at the Tate. It consisted of 334 works of the major pre raphaelites and also of lesser known artists who were associated with the movement, including a large number of works by female artists. So quite ahead of its um, um, time. And what's interesting about this exhibition, it was so comprehensive. All the great works were included in this show. And afterwards, a lot of these loans were translated into gifts. So all these works came to the Tate after this 1923 show. So Rossetti's Girlhood of Mary Virgin, that was donated by Mrs. Toms. Um, Millet's Baron, uh, Baron Numbering His Vassals by Kippen the Holiday Bequest and Burne Jones's Clark Saunders was given by a Mrs. Um Hadley. So all these donors were giving their works to the Tate um, collection. And this really enabled us to build up a you know, substantial collection of pre raphaelite works. It really got underway in the 20th century. Let's take a sip of water at this stage. Now you might be wondering why I've gone on about these early exhibitions. Well, the reason I've done this is to try and dispel the myth, which still, you know, um, still is with us today, that the pre-Raphaelite artists, pre raphaelitism fell out of favor in the 20th century, and it was only rediscovered in the 1960s. I'm showing you, the, telling you about these exhibitions to make the point that pre raphaelites were never out of favor with the general public. People have always loved these works. It's rather been a case of each generation discovering and reevaluating them afresh. Now, a key turning point in the um, appraisal of the pre came in 1948. Remember, Britain had just emerged from World War, and um, there was a sense of wanting to look back, look back nostalgically to the past, and to um, reappraise you know, these wonderful works which seemed so colorful and bright compared to the sort of bleak environment of 1940s um, Europe. And um, there were a lot of people to vote about this at the, the time. And we have to also remember that in the 1940s, the whole course of continental modernism had been put back by um, World War. So it was a time to sort of you know, think about British art and its standing and status in the, in the, in the world. And 1948 was a key year um, all this, this period is a very interesting time in British history. A few years later, there was the um, Festival of Britain, which is really looking back to the Great Exhibition of 1851. There was a sudden sort of outburst of interest in the Victorian era, and this all came to a head in 1948. Um, what I show you here is um, um, on the right-hand side is a contemporary newspaper article by... Um, an artist called Derek Patmore, who was writing about the exhibitions which took place in um, 1948. And he makes this very interesting statement in this article. He talks about our civilization being menaced at the moment. You know, you know, world security is, 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 is threatened. You know, there's a threat of the nuclear bomb, you know, the atom bomb, just emerged from world war. And he goes on to argue, because of this, we need the pre-Raphaelites more than ever, because they, is, they, they present a view of, sort of you know, hope for um, the future, and we should take pride in our culture and our in inheritance. So we shouldn't sort of, um, sneer at these works as intellectuals tend to, Bloomsbury intellectuals tend to do in the 1920s. We should now come back to them and look at them afresh. It's a very interesting um, argument. And uh, on the same year, um, this book was published, pre raphaelite Painters, by Robin Ironside and John Gear. It's a very key text in pre raphaelite studies. This is the first book published on the pre raphaelites which wanted to set them in a broader European context and to argue that they weren't just an insular British movement, but they were pioneers. They pioneer, pioneered modernism on the continent. So with this all going on, um, what else happened? Um, the radio, the, what we used to call the third programme, um, they have 40 programmes devoted to the Victorian era and a whole series on the pre raphaelites And that year, that we also had our, about six exhibitions on the pre raphaelites um, It opened in Birmingham. Birmingham had a massive exhibition of um, pre raphaelites a big loan exhibition, including the applied arts for the first time. And then, then the there's another exhibition in the Whitechapel Art Gallery in London. 
then exhibitions in Liverpool and Manchester, and the last exhibition was the exhibition at the Tate, later in 1948. This consisted of just 23 works. You might say, why 23 works when Birmingham had 280 in its show? And the main point is that Tate was still half closed at this time. It suffered a lot of um, d bomb damage during the war and half the galleries were closed. This is a wonderful um, photograph I found in our archive. It was taken in 1939 and it shows the paintings being taken off the walls to be taken into deep storage during the war years. And you can just see, look at the, the wallpaper and all the stains on it. You know, we didn't sort of um, paint walls each time we changed displays. That sort of paper was up there to last for many, many um, years. But these exhibitions and projects were very important because they included works which museums don't lend nowadays. And this is John Brett's The Stonebreaker, which is one of the major Pre-Aphelite landscape pictures. The Walker Gall Art Gallery never lend that because it's, um, the surface is cracked and it's far too fragile. But all these fragile, what are now considered to be fragile pictures were then lent quite freely between all these museums in Britain. Now, in the intervening years before the next um, big um, pre exhibition, this witnessed the development of a more research-based culture. This happened in the 1950s and 60s. All the descendants and immediate relatives of the pre had sort of died out by this time. So a whole younger group of scholars emerged who had no sense of obligation or familial ties to the artists. And so you see a shift in scholarship away from biography and away from anecdote, more towards documenting and archiving and analyzing what happened within the movement. And this process of reassessment was really heralded by three important exhibitions which took place in the 60s, all organized by one curator, Mary Bennett, who was keeper at the Walker Art Gallery in Liverpool. She organized an exhibition on Maddox Brown in 64, one on Millet in 67, and one on Holman Hunt in 69. And these were comprehensive shows. They're really big cataloging exercises. That's the way to define them. On the Millet exhibition, which I show here, this was shown at the Royal Academy. It transferred from Liverpool to London. This consisted of 400 works. In fact, every single known work by the artist was just put in. And I love this photograph. This is a contemporary photograph. So it just shows how installation has changed over the years. Um, all these um, frankly strange plinths and display panels have been reused. They're all, if you look closely, they're all rather sort of um, knocked about, rather sort of tatty. And the paintings are sort of double, triple um, um, hung, um, bright strip lighting, grey dull walls, very different from how we'd stage an exhibition today. What's also astonishing about this exhibition, and this was in Liverpool, and then it opened in London ten days later. So imagine that, transporting 400 works. First you have to unpack them, you have to deinstall them, pack them, transport them down to London, unpack them, and then install them, all in 10 days. And nowadays, we allow at least a month between um, venues, so quite an astonishing feat. I don't know how they did it. Now, these exhibitions on these founding members of the pre aphelite movement were followed in the 1970s by exhibitions devoted to Rossetti and Burne Jones, which helped, you know, um, foster an interest in the romantic, the later romantic phase of the movement. And this interest in the pre raphaelites starts to translate itself into an increase in the value of the works. Um, pre raphaelite pictures were highly valued in the 19th century, start to tail off in the 20th century. So to give you an example, this famous painting by Burne Jones, Laos Veneris, this was sold in 1971 and fetched 33,000 pounds. It was brought by the Laying Art Gallery in Newcastle. And this is quite a steep increase from the 3,000 pounds it commanded in 1957, you know, just uh, earlier on. And to give you another example, this painting now in the States in a private collection, Millet's um, Huguenot, this sold in um, 1972 for over 31,000 pounds, a vast increase from the 2,000 it commanded in 1946. So people are becoming more and more interested in the pre aphelites and the prices are increasing in a co corresponding um, way. Now, drawing on this new wave of interest in the pre raphaelites the Whitechapel Art Gallery decided to stage an exhibition on the pre raphaelites in 1972. 
And the 70s was an era of economic decline and all sorts of problems in Britain, of our economy, lots of strikes and so on. So this exhibition, they um, actually took an exhibition which was, had been organized by the British Council for Paris, for the Petit Palais in Paris, which was called English Romantic Painters and the Pre-Raphaelites. And the White Chapel just extracted 65 paintings from this exhibition and staged their own Pre-Raphaelite um, show in the East End in the Whitechapel Art Gallery, which you see here. Now, if you go to London, the Whitechapel Art Gallery is you know, um, a, sort of, you know, a, a venue for sh um, showcasing contemporary art from around the world. So it's actually opened in the 19th century as one of these sort of, um, missions to the people um, galleries, you know, art for the, uh, the poor, the gospel, preaching art to promote um, culture to the poor. And this exhibition was quite a, um, an important um, turning point. Younger scholars were involved in writing the catalogue. Um, a lot of um, collaboration was involved in putting it together, even though it only consisted of 65 um, um, works. But it actually consisted of great highlights, including Burne Jones's King Cafetia, which is the work we never lend from the tape now because it's far too um, fragile. Also, this work exhibition was important because it was the first exhibition which charged an entrance fee, an entrance fee of 10 pence. And the gallery was so ashamed in having to do this, it gave everyone a free copy of the catalogue as a ticket to enter um, the exhibition. This was just after decimization had been introduced into Britain, and 10 pence seemed an awful lot of money at that time. But, the ex but they had no funds, they had no funds to put on this exhibition. And um, so they could only recoup the costs by charging this 10 pence um, entrance fee. Now the Whitechapel show is also important because it's the first time the Pre-Raphaelites were defined as being an avant-garde movement. This was picked up in all the press criticism. People said the Pre-Raphaelites are the English avant-garde comparable to the Impressionists. What's interesting is that in the realm of academia and universities, the scholars who were writing on Pre-Raphaelites did not use that term. They were more interested in just documenting on the movement. They shied away from that. And I find this very interesting. I think there are a number of reasons. The first is that they um, wanted to use this documentary approach as a corrective to the sensationalism, the sensational aura, which was developing around the Pre-Raphaelites in the 60s and 70s. This was a time when the Pre-Raphaelites entered the media. This was a time when Ken Russell did Dante's Inferno, when John Hale's The Love School came at big television series. And um, this was a gossipy, um, sensational book. The front cover shows Holman Hunt grasping Annie Miller, who's standing in front of the light of the world. So there's this combination of you know, religion and sex and desire all coming together, all very sort of hated. Um, and then people started writing these sort of fantasies about the Pre-Raphaelites, such as um, all, the, um, all, the, all the Williamson's um, artists and writers in revolt. So the scholars wanted to distance themselves. We don't do this type of scholarship at all. I think that's why they um, didn't go into this, uh, the Pre-Raphaelites are revolutionary artists. But also, at this time, all academics, people working on British art, they were all enthralled to this idea that the avant-garde started in France, and then it went to America. So the, to, to stand up and say, actually, the British were ahead of the game would have been a most appalling thing to do. No one would have dared to say that at the time. Um, the, 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 the academics were very, very deferential. And this deference actually comes through in the next exhibition which took place on the Pre-Raphaelites in 1984. And the, um, the thesis behind that exhibition was to examine whether the Pre-Raphaelites had a shared identity or whether the label Pre-Raphaelitism was really a cloak for brilliantly talented individuals. That was the justification for the exhibition, which you might say is a rather modest claim. Now, the history of this exhibition is rather interesting because it goes back to the 1970s. Um, a, a curator at the um, Tate Gallery called um, Ronald Parkinson, he's the one with the moustache, um, he proposed this exhibition and it lay dormant, by which time he had moved on to the V&A. But in 1980, Alan Bones, who was a professor in history of art at the Cordard Institute, he took over as director of the Tate Gallery, and he took up Parkinson's idea and said, let's make the pre-Raphaelite exhibition of all time. And he brought on board all his students from the Cordard and said, you will write the catalogue um, with me and we'll put on this defining exhibition, um, the exhibition which really will put the pre-Raphaelites on the map. 
And it's, it's, it was a very important exhibition, this. Um, and also it marks a key turning point in the way we staged exhibitions at the Tate. Just to show you this next slide here. Um, the year before, in 1979, um, a specially designated area for exhibitions was opened. This is what we call the 1979 extension, which was designed by Richard Llewellyn Davis. That's that modular block on the top right-hand um, corner. Before this time, all exhibitions were actually held in the main galleries. They were interspersed with the permanent collection. Now, for the first time, the Tate had a special area for exhibitions. Also in the 1970s, we see the development of specialist departments for the first time. So conservation, collection care, education, marketing, development. So all these departments could come together and help put on these important um, exhibitions. In 1980, the government passed the National Heritage Act, which um, introduced GIS, or the Government Indemnity Scheme, and this meant for the first time the government would meet the insurance cost, or the burden of insurance, if a work was damaged. And this meant that we can now start borrowing works from overseas. So this exhibition included works from Australia, South Africa, from the States. Whereas all these exhibitions I've been talking up, up, about up to this point have been from UK collections only. So this 1984 show marked an important turning point. This is an installation shot of the exhibition. There were 250 works altogether in this exhibition, most of them paintings and sculptures. There were works on paper. And they were arranged in chronological sequence. So the idea was to present the Preaphelite Brotherhood between the years 1848 and 1860. So the image I show you here is the gallery devoted to the 1860s. You've got Holman Hunt's children's holiday in the center, surrounded by a lot of Rosettian female um, beauties. This room here, this is the same wall color was chosen throughout. This is the final coda section devoted to the Preaphelites after 1860. You have Laos Veneris, the painting I mentioned earlier on, and two magnificent late Millet landscapes, chill October and winter fuel. So um, they arranged very chronologically just to focus on paintings and sculptures, and the final gallery was given over to works on paper, which were hung in a denser way. There was no interpretation in this um, exhibition, just text panels. You can see that white strip, um, white panel there, introducing the theme of each room, and just um, tombstone information telling you what the work was and um, who, le who lent it. There were no captions describing what, what the content of each work. And this was actually just as well, really, because um, the Tate estimated that 100,000 people would come and see this show. But in fact, the exhibition exceeded all expectation, which attracted half a million visitors. And there were huge crowds around the block, people queuing in to see um, this um, show. So it was the f one of the first blockbusters ever held um, at the Tate. And people were in this exhibition for about two hours plus. Not, not only, they had nothing to do, they're just looking and gazing at these works of art. It was a revelation, and people, there was pre euphoria to took over the whole nation at this time. Now the promotion of this exhibition, there's another shot here I'll show you. This is the entrance to the exhibition. The only period feature are these sort of quasi-Gothic arches at the, um, the entrance, which is where you enter exhibition, just the same as we had of our exhibition a couple of years ago. Now, this, uh, 1984 is also interesting because it was the first time um, the Tate started to look beyond um, the state to the private sector, to you know, the uh, great corporate bodies for sponsorship. And um, the, fa the first business the Tate um, dealt with was the multimedia corporation Pearson, who had sponsored a small land sale exhibition back in 1982, but in 1984, they threw in their lot with the Pre-Raphaelites. They sponsored this exhibition, and this allowed the Tate to have a huge marketing campaign around the Pre-Raphaelites. This is the poster, which shows Mon um, Rosetti's Mono Banner promoting um, the Pre-Raphaelites, and you can see sponsored by Pearson um, underneath. And so um, this association of Pre-Raphaelites with glamour, beauty, this really sort of took on through this marketing campaign. And because of all these people visiting the exhibition, there was a lot of press comment about the show. 
people really engaged in the, this debate about the pre-Aphelites. Is it good art or is it kitsch? This is the big debate in the press at the time. And what does it mean for us today? Now here we have to remember that this exhibition was staged at a time of economic decline. This was the these were the Thatcher um, years, the time when you know, the heavily nationalized industries had given way to free market economics. It was a time of the miners' strike, the big class divisions, you know, strong feminist campaigns. Everyone was very politicized at this time. And the press found this exhibition, gave excellent copy. And so you had people, you know, right-wing critics, loving the pre raphaelites because of um, the craftsmanship and the work which went into the pictures. Someone said, for man hours, we're getting a bargain. And then critics on the left loved it because of you know, the moral, ethical, and social values promoted by paintings such as Malix Brown's work. In fact, all the critics across the political spectrum alighted on this picture as being the most truthful and relevant painting for the, for the present day, which in its representations of stark social divisions in the 1850s had relevance for audiences today. So the pre were becoming contemporary now, at the same time, in academic circles, um, another sort of debate was take, um, gathering um, ground. And this is also the time when there's a development of what we call the new art history, where a lot of um, art historians influenced by sort of Marxist philosophy and literary um, th um, theory wanted to look at pictures in a different way, in a more critical um, way. And um, a number of um, art historians looked at this exhibition and they attacked it. They attacked it for sort of, you know, endorsing this idea of celebrating male, masculine genius, um, dominant bourgeois, sexist, racist um, values, and they accused the Tate of colluding um, in this. And um, this challenge started off with one of the contributors to the catalogue, one of the contributors to the catalogue who worked on the only female artist who was represented in the exhibition, and that was Elizabeth Siddle, who was represented by this work um, Lady Clare here. And um, this um, art historian said there are only two works by this artist, where all the other female artists associated with the pre aphelite movement. And um, this idea developed that, that the exhibition was really um, there to celebrate this cult of genius around artists such as Rossetti. And women were only represented as what we call in Britain as wags, wives and girlfriends. And um, the idea was that they should be shown as artists in their own right. And in fact, this um, um, artist when Deborah Cherry, when she came to write her biographic entry on Elizabeth Siddle, she made no reference to the fact that she was married to Rossetti because she wanted to make the point she should be appreciated as an artist in her own right. And Leslie Paris, the Tate curator, who was editor of the catalogue, he wouldn't have this. He said, this is denying history altogether. You have to stick to the facts. And a huge battle just broke out between curators in museums and academics. Academics saying, we don't want this sort of, you know, um, rather sort of connoisseurial approach to art. We don't want biography. We don't want narrative. We want to engage with the issues. And um, it's all developed, this debate, around this pre raphaelite um, exhibition. And uh, this was a very exciting moment. And the reason I'm quite excited about it myself is because I was a student at this time. I'd come down from Nottingham University to London to study at the Courtauld. And this exhibition was on, and I saw it, and everyone was fired up by these debates. And after seeing this exhibition, I decided I wanted to go on and study on Victorian art. And so what happened in the, I think, in the years after this exhibition, and there was an explosion of interest in the pre raphaelites in the universities. And lots of exhibitions were put on in museums. This is one of them here, pre raphaelite women artists, dealing with particular themes and issues, rather than moving away from the survey idea and saying, let's actually look critically at, at various aspects of the movement. And so you could actually say that the, um, the academics, the universities, had won the battle because the curators were now giving in to this new way of interpreting and looking at pictures. But at the same time, as we sort of moved on through the 80s into the 90s, there was also a sense that what had been gained with all these new ways of looking at art was at the risk of reducing the art object to a form of social history or identity politics. And um, a younger generation of art historians, I, I would include myself then as one of those, wanted to try and look at the aesthetic qualities of the paintings, their material aspects, and try, try to look at their sta the status of pre within a broader history of art. And this sort of shift to actually looking at the pictures as being works of art and looking at them in terms of where they're constructed and the meanings they 
generate as paintings was really brought about by a, a, a series of single artist shows which took place in the early years of the 21st century. Um, exhibitions on Rossetti, then there's one on Millet. This is the Millet exhibition I was involved with. This is the installation shot with the Ophelia against this green um, background. Then there were exhibitions on Hunt and then Maddox Brown. And it's on the back of these exhibitions that it seemed the time was ripe to do an exhibition, another survey show on the pre -Raphaelites. And this, of course, is the exhibition, pre -Raphaelites Victorian Avant-Garde. This is a slide of it on, on here. Now, um, I worked with this exhibition with two American academics, Jason Rosenfeld and Tim Umbaringer. And we'd all, we all were more or less the same age. We'd all seen the 1984 show, and we were all very influenced by it, but we were determined to do something different. So we persuaded the director of the Tate to, that we could hold the exhibition in the same upper galleries, which were usually set aside for modern and contemporary works. We wanted to put the pre there, as they were in 1984. But um, we organized it in a very different way. The organization was thematic rather than chronological, because we wanted to actually engage with the issues which underpin the pre movement. So we opened up with, an ex with a room on the manifesto paintings and the origins of the pre and the Nazarenes, an artist such as William Blake and Dice in England. And then we moved on to this room, which is about history painting, showing how the pre pitched their challenge in the realm of history painting, painting subjects from British history rather than from mythology, and painting figures in a very particular rather than an idealized way. Then the exhibition moved on to look at themes to do with landscape painting, the influence of photography on the pre lens, and then we had this fantastic space in the middle of the exhibition called Salvation, which brought together religious paintings with themes from contemporary life, just to show how sort of religious unthinking sort of permeated every aspect of Victorian art and culture, and it formed the representations of contemporary subjects. And this allowed us to make wonderful juxtapositions. So um, here you see Paul Lennox Brown's Jesus Washing Peter's Feet next to some artisan's furniture designed by Lennox Brown. Because Brown in the painting shows Jesus as being a humble workman, you know, a humble sort of artisan. And this is also brought out in the furniture he designed as well. And then in the background, you've got um, our wonderful Millet, Christ in the House of His Parents, and the temple picture by Hunt I showed you earlier on. So these paintings were brought together in striking juxtaposition. And then the next room went, changed track completely. It looked at beauty and the development of the ascetic movement. Then there was a wonderful room given over to the idea of utopia and paradise and the arts and crafts movement around William Morris and the idea that um, the art the arts, rather than being on the periphery, should be at the center of life, and that labor and craft should be ennobling for the maker as well as for the consumer. And then um, the final room was um, called Mythologies, and this looked at the late, later work of the Paraphalites and introduced Burne Jones, who of course was a younger artist. This is a shot looking from the beauty room, where you see um, Hunt's Dolce Far Niente, through to the Paradise room, and then beyond to um, the Mythologies room, with Burne Jones's The Golden Stairs, and out to another Burne Jones in the, 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 in the, ha the hallway. So it's, it's, you know, it's, it's wonderful. You know, I, I feel very excited about this um, um, show, because it's very exciting um, to work on. But um, I think there's some different things happening in this exhibition. We wanted to emphasize the way the artists worked collaboratively with each other across different types of media. So we didn't just have paintings, we had sculptures, we had works on paper, we had the applied arts, we had embroideries, we had a bed cover, we had furniture, we had cupboards, stained glass, you name it, it was all in this show. And this also allowed us to introduce the female artists um, who, were rep who were associated with the movement, designers such as May Morris, Jane Morris, um, Bessie Burden, as well as the female artists such as Elizabeth um, um, Siddle. What we didn't have space to do was to look at the legacy um, who were the artists in Britain who came after the pre who were influenced them. And we didn't have quite so many works on paper as those earlier exhibitions I mentioned, again, because of reasons of um, space. Another key thing about this exhibition, it was an exhibition with a message. It was called pre Victorian Avant-Garde. And the idea was to really you know, show the, 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 the pre as a key avant-garde on movement. Artists who rebelled against the teaching of the Royal Academy, inaugurating this new style of painting based on a fragmentation of vision rather than pictorial synthesis, bright um, colors rather than muted um, um, tones. We wanted to show how they wanted to be historic and modern at the same time. 
historic and looking back to Renaissance art, modern engaging with new technological forms such as um, photography. So, um, and we also wanted to take the story right up to the turn of the century. The 1984 show, as I mentioned, stopped in 1860 with a little coda after, whereas our exhibition went right up to 1900 because we wanted to pose the question, where, what did the Pre-Raphaelites influence after that? And of course, the next chapter is how it influenced pan-European symbolism. We didn't have space to engage with that in this exhibition. That's obviously the subject of a future show um, out there. But what's interesting, this topic was actually picked up in the tour of the exhibition, because um, unlike the earlier exhibitions, this was an exhibition which actually toured overseas. Back in 1984, various overseas museums, such as the Brooklyn Museum, the Art Gallery of New South Wales, approached the Tate and said, can we take your pre aphelite show? But the answer was no, because no one would lend or consider um, um, lending. There had been exhibitions from the pre aphelites of course, in Europe, and America before, but never one organized by a British institution. But um, in 2012-13, this exhibition went to Washington, Moscow, Japan, and then Italy. Back in 1984, in the years immediately preceding Perestroika, it would have been inconceivable that Americans and Russians would have conversed with each other about a pre aphelite exhibition. This is exactly what happened in 2012. Um, it's quite interesting to sort of reflect on the course of the tour, just to conclude this um, 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 talk. Um, as I mentioned, first of all, it went to um, Washington. And in America, they gave it a very conservative title. They didn't call it Pre-Raphaelites Victorian Avant-Garde. They called it Victorian Art and Pre-Raphaelites Victorian Art and Design. And this is interesting, because in America, um, you may not agree, but um, particularly in Washington, in the National Gallery of Art, the consensus still is that modern art started in France and then migrated to America. And um, this sort of formalist aesthetic still presides, and the, you know, the, the Director Museum could not accept that the pre were an avant-garde movement. And this was reflected in some of the press criticism. There's a New York critic called Roberta Smith, who writes for the New York Times, and she compared this painting by Holman Hunt, the Lady of Shalott, with the paintings by Cezanne in the surrounding galleries. And she said it's merely a case of com comparing what is com um, complex, what is merely complicated. So rather disparaging um, terms, we weren't very um, <laughs> pleased with um, that. But it's quite interesting comparing this type of response with what happened when the exhibition went to Moscow when it opened at the Pushkin Museum. The um, Russians have had a long fascination with the pre raphaelites There's never been a show on pre raphaelism before, probably because of its Rus Russian um, history, the Soviet um, era. But um, this um, exhibition was the lifelong ambition of the 90-year-old director of the museum, Madame Arina Antonova, who's shown here on the opening night, um, besieged by um, the press. And the Russians just couldn't get enough of this exhibition, and they felt a sense of kinship between the Pre-Raphaelites and modern art in Russia, from you know, Nesterov through to Goncharova, and they felt the literary aspects of pre really chimed in with their own literary traditions, thinking of the great ethical and moral novels of Tolstoy to Gainev, all the way through to the symbolist you know, imaginings of the silver poets like Anna Arktimova. You know, they just felt everything in pre was relevant to their own literature and um, um, culture. They couldn't get enough of this exhibition. And in fact, in London and in Washington, we had about 200,000 visitors um, between you know, each. But in Moscow, there were about 450,000 visitors came to see this show. And they could have taken it for more. They asked for three more weeks. We gave it to them, but we couldn't have any more than that. Because the, the exhibition was then traveling on to Japan, where it went to the Mori Art Center. Um, the Japanese have shown pre raphaelite exhibitions before. They just love the pre raphaelites particularly the romance of the movement, and they have this fascination with Ophelia. And it's quite funny, they had a, there was a conference I attended on the pre -Aphalites. A lot of academics came together, and the question they all wanted to ask was, given their obsession with the beautiful pre idea, was, who do you like best, Lizzie or Jamie, Elizabeth Siddle or Jane Morris? <laughs> now, that was very um, amusing. But um, just when the, ex the, the, ex the exhibition was going to come back to London from Tokyo, um, an Italian media company um, who organized exhibitions for museums approached us and said, please, please, can we have this in Italy before it comes back to England? At first we said, no, it's impossible. But then we thought, well, wh wh why not? The paintings are only going to go into store before we put them back on display in August. So the exhibition ended up being shown 
at the um, Palazzo Chiablesi in Turin. And um, under this wonderful title of Graphite Utopia of Beauty. I should say that the exhibitions in Tokyo and in Italy were just Tate works, just Tate graphite works, because the other lenders would not lend beyond three venues. So these last two venues were just Tate only works. But this exhibition went down a storm in Italy as well. And they wanted to make it relevant to their own Italian culture. So they actually put onto the exhibition a separate section showing how the graphites have influenced contemporary fashion and music and pop culture and they made comparisons with Alexander McQueen and other um, designers to show how the graphites were right up to the minute. So that's a whirlwind touring for you of the history of the creating the Pyrapholites. The paintings that I mentioned at the beginning have come back, they're now on our walls, and the question everyone is now saying is, what next? And um, well, I think for the time being, we're not going to lend them. They've been, on this, they've been all around the world. People want to see them in London. So they're now on our walls, and people are enjoying seeing them. But already, people are approaching me and saying, well, can we have this work or that? We want to do an exhibition on this. On Monday, before I came here, someone came down to see me from another museum in Britain and said, we're doing an exhibition on this, um, this aspect of pre Can we have these works? So the negotiations have started up or, um, um, immediately. But I think what will happen over the next um, decade or so, there may be exhibitions on particular aspects of preapatism, but never a big survey show. I don't know that will happen again in my lifetime or while I'm at the Tate. It's a big o open um, 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 question. But at the same time, I can say that these exhibitions have played a key role in making turning the Preapolites from being a British art movement to being a global phenomenon. They are now considered to be one of the great art movements in the history of art. And so when I sit at my desk, when it's very bleak in London, when it's pouring with rain outside, and I'm answering hundreds and hundreds of emails, and I feel rather down, I can console myself with the thought that I've been lucky enough to make a contribution to this incredible history and to help establish the Preapolites as being one of the great art movements of all time. And on that note, I'll stop. Thank you very much. We thank Allison very much for her uh, time here, and she has been most generous with it. And uh, hope that you will uh, come back and uh, see the forthcoming exhibitions in, in, uh, in the Museum of Art, in which you might actually see some British paintings coming up. There's a second reason Allison's here. <laughs> Good evening. Thank you for coming tonight.